Hello plant people, how are you guys doing today? If you're new around here, my name is Ashley and I'm a soul scientist. On this channel, I like to take that science and apply it to all things plants. In today's video, we're talking about flour substitutes or actual flour that you can bake with, cook with, do some just regular old baking with that's not wheat. So I think there's two reasons for this video. First one being there's a ton of videos out there where I'm seeing people, I'm not going to name names, um, influencers growing like patches of wheat or patches of flax or rye or whatever the case is. That's crazy. <laughs> so I am a farm girl. We do farm in our family and uh, that's, and obviously I work in agriculture too. That's a little weird. You're going to get like two loaves total, but there are crops out there that are much more efficient for us gardeners to grow that will give us flour that we can cook and bake and utilize. That actually does store for up to a year, which in some cases is actually longer than wheat flour is. And so, yeah, let's talk about what those crops are because I know there's people worried about food shortages and people are really trying to maximize their garden space to um, grow high caloric density, but um, obviously usable and valid products. And um, wheat or flour in general is going to be one of those products that uh, may or may not exist in abundance here in the next little bit, only because Russia and Ukraine, Russia and Ukraine are bread baskets. They're very similar to the prairies here in Canada and in the US, they make the world grain what it is. And so the fact that they're not uh, seeding in Ukraine. I know this for a fact, and they're not seeding in um, all parts of Russia. Some parts of Russia they are still seeding, but obviously they're not gonna be exporting to us. Um, the reason I know that is because my company sells fertilizer equipment to both Ukraine and to Russia. And so we had to cut Russia off, um, and Ukraine's clearly not buying, um, and very likely not going to be seeding anything. So there's maybe an issue here. I'm not going to be, I'm personally, I'm not too concerned about wheat per se, um, like flour for like Robin Hood baking wheat flour. I don't think that's going to be the issue. I think it's going to be the pastas that are going to be the problem because that's Durham. And um, those are obviously processed outside of maybe necessarily Canada. But I mean, a lot of, flour mills and stuff like that are very local sourced products um, grown in Canada, harvested in Canada, and then actually ground in Canada because it's not the most shelf stable thing ever when it's in that powder form. So I'm not actually not too worried about that. But nonetheless, let's talk about some actual usable crops we can grow to make flour at home. So these all use the exact same um, format when it comes to processing. So we're going to let it dry out, whether this be we're cutting it really thin and putting it in the dehydrator, we're letting it sun um, dry, or if we're putting it in the oven, whatever the case is, but we're dehydrating it. And then we're going to stick it in a blender and we're going to crush it. Now it's going to make a really fine powder, like a dust. And from there, we have two different options. We can do um, like a white flour and we can sift the product to remove any coloration um, that may come from the types of products we're using, or we can leave it in and then it would be considered a whole grain or a whole wheat or whatever the case. Um, is and that may in some cases depending on what you're using cause some forms of odd coloration um, Which may or may not be up some people's alleys like if you have kids I can see them not enjoying this But if you're an adult then it's kind of like well, it doesn't really matter obviously if you don't sift or you don't um, Clean it. It's gonna have a different flavor profile as well So you're gonna have to experiment experiment find out what you like what your family likes that sort of thing and then obviously go from there. So the first one on the list is actually zucchini or squash in general, but in particular zucchini. So this flour is identical, pretty much identical to regular wheat flour. 
You can do like a 50-50 in baking or a 25-75, whatever the case is, or you can just use straight zucchini flour. Now it is gluten free. So if you use zucchini flour, um, it's not going to maybe rise. It's going to be a little bit more dense. Um, and the gluten free folk out there actually are going to have some really good recipes for cooking with this, but it can be utilized in that sense. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is this is also considered like a keto bread. So it's low carb or almost no carb, which I find kind of crazy, but I guess it makes sense. Um, so in the keto community, it's often used as well. And it's really, very really expensive to buy at the store, but super simple to make at home. So it will take you five pounds of zucchini to make one pound of flour. So to put that in perspective, you're gonna need a lot of zucchini. Um, but the good news is zucchinis are incredibly prolific, meaning they're very, very good at producing uh, very large and abundant numbers of zucchini fruit. And the key when making zucchini flour is to actually let them to get to that ginormous, what seemed to be almost unedible size. That's the size you want to harvest from, and that's the size that you want to dry and grind and process into flour. So leaving the zucchini on until basically the frost hits is your ideal situation. And honestly, some cases, I swear one fruit will be five pounds um, because they do get very, very large. The second one, which is kind of my favorite, and I'm actually going to be doing this this these this year because i'm incredibly interested in this i love tortilla chips um i like like quesadilla uh, flatbreads that sort of thing so that's kind of what spurred me on doing this this year um but corn and more specifically that really cool glass corn or rainbow corn or purple corn in particular can be used dried out, ground, or blend, you basically put it in a blender, um, and then used for tortilla chips, that sort of thing. So with that being said, you're going to have to get very specific types of corn. It has to be like the rainbow, the glass, or like the purple corn. It can't be like the peaches and cream, or baby corn, or ornamental corn, anything like that. Um, anything that says like eat raw, is not gonna work here. Um, I mean, it's going to work to an extent, but it just won't work as well. So you want to aim for these really pretty looking, colorful looking corn options, which who doesn't want to go for that? So, and again, this stores for about six months. You can freeze it and then it'll store a little bit longer. Um, and I have seen some people can flowers before, um, or like vacuum seal them in jars. Obviously, that's going to last a little bit longer in that case as well. Whenever it comes to corn to harvest for flour, what I would do is I would leave it just on the stalk um, and let it simply dry out naturally in the field for as long as possible and then remove it and then spread it out inside the house or in sun and let it sun dry for as long as possible. It should be basically hard like a rock before you go to harvest it. It should be like popcorn kernel type um, hardness. Um, and then that would be what you're going to actually blend. And the last one is potatoes. So you can do any type of potato for this. Obviously, the larger, the better. Um, but you can dehydrate this and then blend it. And this is actually really good for making like Idaho uh, mashed potatoes. That's what that's made out of. And then obviously you can bake with this too or cook with it, not bake with it. So with the potatoes, um, I've made like my own Idaho potatoes because I don't have a ton of cold storage here. I basically have like this one section underneath my steps, which is like not the greatest um, situation. So I will dry and then blend it into a powder, which can then be used for like mashed potatoes and that sort of thing. And it can be used for a thickener. So a thickener in like gravies, pasta sauces, um, any sort of liquid soups that sort of thing it doesn't bake well though like i've never tried to like make bread out of it i guess you could say and maybe that's m just my lack of knowledge when it comes to this sort of stuff but i do know it can be difficult 
um, if not impossible. But there's a ton of recipes using all three forms of those flour. Um, obviously, they're going to be really specific to people who have like gluten intolerances or um, like the keto community. But nonetheless, there's a ton of recipes out there. I've done a lot of these recipes. They work great. Um, and it is an alternative to flour that's more, it's more justifiable as a gardener to do these three options before doing wheat or rye or flax or anything like that, right? So just something to keep in mind there. But I want to thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button, and I will talk to you guys next time. Bye.